behaviour avoids the use of anthropology. 2016 paper, this is question 16, multiple choice. Which of the following descriptions of animal behaviour avoids the use of anthropomorphism? Avoids, okay, and anthropomorphism means that you're putting human characteristics onto organisms that are not necessarily showing those. So you're looking for things where you're making a emotional judgment about what's happening okay so we're avoiding this in some primate species alpha males often bully lower ranking animals this our definition of bully is very much linked to what we think that is okay in late summer uh, worker bees like to visit heather flowers again this is attributing some form of emotional response that we don't know that they have at all uh, the grin on the chimpanzee's face showed that it was amused by the gesture again you're making a judgment call about amusement and you're assuming it's very much like ours. And then we have the male moth is attracted to the female by the scent molecules that she emits. Well, this this is a chemical thing that they were talking about here. It is not any form of emotional decision. So it's D. 17. A population of chafer beetles were damaging the teas and greens of a golf course. Results from a mark and recapture study suggested a population size that was too small to account for the extent of the damage caused. One possible re for reason for this is... Okay, so we are looking at your formula here. So we've got... Um, we have your total population, which you're going to calculate. You get that population by getting the first pop capture you did. Okay, so this is the first capture and this is your marked sample that you released. Okay, the number that you marked from the first capture. And this is your second capture. And you have to take into account the fraction of the second capture which was still marked. Okay, so this is your second capture that was, mar that was marked. Okay, so the closer the R is to C, the closer it is to the first basically n so if we have a large number of r relative to c then we think that n was actually close to the population basically um right okay so uh we're looking for things that might change that okay so white paint used to mark the beetles washed off some of them before the recapture well that would actually go the other way around okay that would actually um decrease the number that were marked and so the fraction would actually get smaller and that would mean it would look like a bigger population so not a Okay, um, white paint used to mark the beetles made them more visible to predators than unmarked. Same deal, we're removing some artificially and that means it'll look like there's less of the fraction that was marked. Total number of beetles in the recapture sample was less than the number first captured and marked. That doesn't actually matter because this is again a fraction that you're doing, so it's not that. This one is actually the most common example of why it doesn't work anyway. So marked beetles did not have enough time after release to spread out and mix with the rest of the population. That means that this fraction here that you're doing, this kind of C to R, that's not a true mix of the population because they didn't have enough time to properly mix in the population. Okay. Ellis van Creveld syndrome is a rare genetic condition. It is much more common in an isolated population in North America, which was founded by a small number of individuals than in the general population. The most likely explanation for this is, so what we've got here is, this is the founder effect, okay? So the founder effect is created by effectively producing a bottleneck um, where you have the large population with all of the variety inside the large population, whatever that is, and then you have taken out a small one of these and this is then what goes on to produce the whole of the rest of the population. I really should have changed the colour of my pen, but you get the idea, okay? So it's not natural selection, um, because that would be um, you creating it from the general population. Um, same as sexual selection. It's not about random mutation. That would change it again. This is a form of genetic drift. Okay, Hardy Weinberg. The frequency of a given allele in a population is a measure of how common that allele is as a proportion of the total number of copies of all alleles at a specific locus. Okay, that's a definition. For a locus with one dominant allele, and you've got big A's and little A's, and one recessive, the frequency of the dominant allele P and the frequency of the recessive allele Q can be used to calculate the genetic variation in a population using the equations below. They are quite nice, they've given you them. Okay, so we've got P plus Q equals 1. And then we've got p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. And they've even given you the definitions of each of these things here. Okay. If the allele frequency of the recessive allele is 
So that would be this one here. OK, uh, the proportion of individuals that would be heterozygous is so I'm looking for my 2PQ. And then it's just a little bit of number crunching and it's not hideous because they've given you everything. Right. So P plus Q equals one. You have been told that Q is 0.7. So P plus 0 0.7 equals one. So P, let's make that seven clear, is 0 0.3. Right. So now I've got P and I've got Q, which means I can now plug that whole thing in to my P squared. It's 2PQ plus Q squared equals one. OK, so I'm going to put in uh, 0.3 squared plus 2PQ plus 0.7 squared. Now, you might be doing this in, in quicker steps. I'm just trying to show you the whole thing in case that's a, a stress of this. Um, so 2PQ is equal to 1 minus 0.3 squared minus 0.7 squared. Stick it on your calculator. Uh, gives me 0 0.42. And that was what they told me was I was looking for. Looking for that. Looking for that. OK. In the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, the gene for eye colour is sex linked. The allele for the red eye, rad, sorry, the allele for the red eye is dominant to the allele for white eye. Cross between two flies produce the offspring shown in the table below. Now you might already know what gives you a one-to-one -one male and female, but they've given you a whole pile of genotypes for the cross, so I'm just going to work them to show where we're going with this. Right, so we've got XR, XR crossed with X big R, X, sorry, Y. Okay, so this is, this is cross one or cross A. So that would give me a female with red eyes. This would give me another female with red eyes. This would give me a male with white eyes and a male with white eyes. So that gives me a 50-50. This is not what I have here at all. Okay, so it's not one. Do it again. Okay, so I'm now looking at B. So I've got X big R, X little r, X little r, Y. So I've got a female with red eyes. I have a female with white eyes. I have a male with red eyes and I've got a male with white eyes. So there we go. That's a one to one on the males for red and white and a one to one for the females, which is exactly what we have here. So B is the correct answer just to prove it. OK, uh, this is C. If I had to make it clear, here's A, here's B, here's C. OK, C, uh, the female we've got in here and the male. OK, so we have female, red eyes, female, red eyes, male, red eyes, male, white eyes. Not what we see, definitely not C. And oh, I've got just enough space over here for D. Sorry, it's a little bit scribbly. Uh, where are we going? So X big R, X big R. So that's our female. And here's our male. So we have a female, red, female, red, uh, male, red, and male, red. OK, now you, there's lots of shortcuts for this. You can see what's happening quite often just by looking at the genotypes that you know. But if you have the time, I would work the crosses because why would you not? And you have the time. OK, which row in the table best describes an R-selected species? So R-selected, we are looking at the basic population curve and we're looking for things that like being here. OK, so we are looking for a species which runs on the kind of exponential point. OK, not up the top here. This is where we find our K-selected. So we are looking for things that increase numbers quickly. So they're going to have a lot of offspring. Uh, the thing is that they actually don't put a lot of care into their offspring because they've produced so many, so that's a little. And overall, we don't expect that many of them to survive. It's a numbers game we're going for for this one. So A is our correct answer. Question 22. Shags and cormorants both belong to the genus, not even going to attempt to say that. They look very similar and nest near each other on the same cliffs. The table below shows the main components of each bird's diet. So we've got different animals which are feeding on and then we've got our percentage composition of diet and in some cases we have substantial differences but in fact this one the cormorant doesn't eat at all okay data in the table shows right 
Competitive exclusion. Well, no, because they're both still alive. Okay, exclusion means to completely remove, and that would mean that one of them would outcompete the other to the point of killing them off, so no. Competition within each species. Well, that's going to be true because intraspecific competition is a real thing, and in fact, stronger than interspecific, you would say. But there's no information in the data in the table telling you that, so it's not this. Um, resource partitioning, yes, because what we have is some resources are being heavily used by the shags and some of them are being heavily used by the cormorants and vice versa. So they're dropping it down. So they're removing competition by just saying, you know what, you have them, that's okay. It isn't the fundamental niche because the definition of a fundamental niche has to be without competition. So that would be if there were uh, no cormorants at all, what is the proportion of the diet that would go to each of these with no competition? But you can't see that because we have um, a realised niche that you're seeing here. Okay. Okay, question 23. A species of parasitic wasp, you can read the Linnaeus name if you want to, lays its eggs in the larvae of flies where the eggs develop. This species displays a behaviour called superparasitism. We're following the laying of eggs by one wasp. A second wasp, wasp may superparasitise the same host by also laying its eggs. Lovely. Okay. Researchers investigated the effects of superparasitism on the brood size and sex ratio of offspring in this species. Results were compared to control that had been parasitised only once. Researchers were able to distinguish between the offspring of the first and second wasp. They're obviously having to put that in there because otherwise you'd be going, well, how would they know? Okay. Results are shown in the table below. Um, so we've got brood size, percentage of males. We've got two wasps that underwent superparasitism and we've got single parasitism control okay um, and the degree of parasitism uh, so this is your wasp one wasp two in the super parasitism one and we've got a plus or minus threes twos fours so we've got a range that's going on here okay following statements refer to the data and we're looking for which of the statements are valid conclusions okay so super parasitism excuse me <coughs> super parasitism significantly increased the percentage of males produced by both wasp one and two Okay, so percentage of males, we've got 7 plus or minus 2, so as far as 9 or 5, uh, 22 plus or minus 4, so that's going as high as um, 20, 26 and as low as 18. And here was our control, and that was going as high as 7 and as low as 5. So this one here was not statistically different, okay, didn't significantly increase the percentage. So... No, not one. So that means that I can at least get rid of um, A and B. Okay. Um, we're now looking at... So we've got 2 and 3 and 2 and 4 are still in the running, which is good to know. I suppose we've got rid of one. Superparasitism significantly increased the percentage of males produced by wasp 2 only. Well, we've just done that work. And yes, that seemed to make a difference here. Um, so, yeah, happy with two. Um, Superparasitism had no significant effect on brood size. Well, here's our brood size. So 18 plus or minus 3, 17 plus or minus 4, and 20 plus or minus 2. Well, plus or minus 2 on 20 gets me to 18, so that's an overlap there. And also this takes me up to 21, overlap. 17 plus 4 would get me into this as well. So, yeah, superparasitism does not change the brood size at all. Um, which gives us our answer at C. Uh, just to check, superparasitism significantly decreased the brood size produced by wasps 1 and 2. Well, no, we've just worked through that. They didn't. Okay, so C. Okay, last question of the paper. Florida scrub jays have evolved a cooperative breeding system in which helper birds assist breeding pairs in raising young. Table below compares the effect of helpers on the breeding successes of birds that are either experienced or inexperienced breeders. Helpers increase the average number of offspring reared by inexperienced breeding pairs compared to breeding, experienced breeding pairs by how much? Okay, so you be, this isn't as bad as it looks, but you're just going to have to be very careful that you haven't gone off on a tangent. Okay, so we are looking for what is the percentage difference here, increase with helpers without, and then what's this percentage with helpers and without, and then what's the difference between the two? Okay. So let's do the inexperienced first. 
right, and I did write this down somewhere, where are we going? So my difference between 2.2 and 1.24 is 0 0.96. Divide that by my start, 1.24, sorry. Times that all by 100. They made a 77% difference, okay? The experienced, however, did improve it because it's gone from 1.8 to 2.38, but that means the difference is only 0 0.58. Divide that by the without, 1.8 times it by 100, means that they did make a difference, but only 32% of a difference. So the difference between the inexperienced and experienced is 45. So C. And that's us.